looking at the book of Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament. It is the 21st book in the Old Testament. It follows Psalms, Proverbs, and it comes right before Song of Solomon. And uh, the book of Ecclesiastes is what is typically known as a wisdom book. That Proverbs and Psalms and uh, these are these are what's called are what are called wisdom books because they will give us wisdom and perspective on how to live our life. And the name Ecclesiastes actually comes, uh, what it means is to, to call an assembly. Because there's a man that, that wrote this book, the 12 chapters in the book of Ecclesiastes, named King Solomon. And what we talked about last week was that King Solomon had the rare opportunity and ability to do everything that you and I would ever want or think about doing. He had the opportunity and the ability to do what he says in scripture, everything under the sun. And he literally did it to the nth degree. He, he said, hey, I want to go kind of explore the meaning of life and to see if it's found in pleasure. And he had a thousand wives. He's like, hey, I'm going to go. I'm going to see if this is where you can really find pleasure and meaning. And what I started out with last week was a movie from 1989 that was pretty famous called Dead Poets Society. And Dead Poets Society is the story of a professor, a mentor, a teacher named John Keating. And Keating is played by the late Robin Williams. And Keating has some unconventional ways of trying to, to motivate his students to live extraordinary lives. There's one famous passage and scene in that movie where Keating takes his students and he has them out in kind of the trophy case area of this school, this prestigious school. And he asks one of the students to open the hymnal to him 542, and he wants him to, to read the first lines from this hymn. It's a poem by Robert Herrick, and here's what the student reads. Gather ye rosebuds while ye may. Old time is still a-flying. And this same flower that smiles today Tomorrow will be dying. He asks his students, what does the author mean? One student in the back, kind of in a cavalier way, says, the author's in a hurry. Robin Williams says, boing, wrong. It's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that life and time is a gift, and it's short. He brings them over to the trophy case, and he begins to have them look at pictures of classes that were there 100 years before them, 80 years before them, 70 years before them. He says, come. Draw close. Do you hear what they're saying to you? Look at their faces. They're just like you. They have the same hopes, the same dreams, the same testosterone. But lads, they're feeding worms now. He says, listen. Do you hear it? Seize 
the day. Seize the day. What we're doing in this series is we are pressing in and putting our ear close and looking at a man named Solomon who literally tried everything that you and I would ever think about trying, that would, we would ever think would give us satisfaction, that we would ever think would be, okay, we, we've arrived, we're here. Like, I have peace now, I have fulfillment now, I have all, he's saying, look, I tried all of that. And I found it all to be futile apart from God. Let me read something to you. Here's the big idea from last week. The message of Ecclesiastes isn't that earthly joys are meaningless and worthless, but they're not ultimate. Ultimate meaning and fulfillment comes from knowing, walking with, and enjoying God and everything He has given us. In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon gives us five reasons why he discovered that life can seem repetitive, redundant, meaningless, uh, futile, empty, whatever you want to say. Solomon says, hey, life is futile under the sun because of these reasons. One, the universe is indifferent. Good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. <laughs> good things happen to good bad. He says, he says, like, the universe is indifferent. Why try to figure it out? Death is unfair and the ultimate end of life. Time is aimless. The problem of evil and the seeming remoteness of God. Solomon said, like, like, I can't find fulfillment. I can't find meaning. I've tried it in pleasure. I've tried it in accomplishment. I've tried it in drinking. I've tried it in socializing. I've tried it in being in the right crowd. I've tried it in having six. I've tried it in getting a bigger house. I've tried it in getting better clothes. I've tried it in, in going to different parts of the world. I've tried it in getting an education and degrees on my wall. I've, try, I've tried all of that. And, and yet, I'm still empty. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, this is madness. I can't figure it out. So Solomon then examines five commonly proposed philosophical alternative cures for the plight of emptiness in life. Worldly wisdom. Worldly pleasure, worldly wealth and power, worldly duty, and worldly religion. In other words, in the face of meaninglessness, all of us might try to live a life of philosophy to fill the mind. Hedonism to fill the body. Materialism to fill the pocket. Ethics to fill your conscience or religion to fill your spirit. Some of these drugs can be combined. The first three correspond to what Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard called the aesthetic stage of life. Self-satisfaction. Hey, real meaning is found in self-satisfaction. Come on. That's what Mountain Dew's telling you. Come on. That's what everything around us, that's all the marketing, it's telling us, right? It's telling us, hey, real fulfillment, real meaning is found in what? Self-satisfaction. The fourth is the ethical stage where we try to live by principle. The fifth and final is religiousness apart from God. I love what 
philosopher Peter Kreft said this. Every serious hedonist who has tried this life knows the result of the experiment. Pleasure inevitably becomes boring. The pursuit of pleasure often turns into addictions. Stronger and stronger doses must be found to fend off the familiarity and the boredom. You always have to go further, further, more, deeper, more. On the other hand, when pleasure is placed into the context of knowing God and following His guidelines, we end up taking an inordinate delight in the good things that God has made without misusing them. Solomon's saying, it's not that we should live lives of, of what's called you know, literally fatalism. Oh gosh, it doesn't matter what I do. It's all going to burn anyway. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm going to die. I could die tomorrow. It doesn't matter what I do. No, 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 no. Solomon is not exhorting us to live lives of desperation and fatalism. Nor is he saying over here, live this lives of idealism. Oh, no. Listen, guys. Every single day, I drive up Ronald Reagan Boulevard at some point in the day to my house. And I see a sign for a builder every single day that says, Hill Country Living, life without interruption." And I go, lie! <laughs> lie! And then I turn my TV on, and this dude's got an incredible, welcome to Santa Rita Ranch. Hill country living at its fine. No worries in the world. And you move into the house, and somebody gets sick. And then you lose your job. Look, what Solomon is saying is, idealism a reality and neither is fatalism now listen today I want to talk about in the next 15 minutes I want to talk about one of the things that Solomon talks that's woven all through the book of Ecclesiastes and it's this, time is a gift. What are you doing with it? Time is a gift. Let me, let me read some statistics for you. The average person will live 78 years on this planet. Some more, some less, 78 years. 28.3 years you will be sleeping. 10.5 years you will be working, of which 50% of the people who are working will tell you in all the polls that they hate what they're doing. Nine years you will be on TV and social media. Six years you will be doing chores. Four years you'll be eating and drinking. 3.5 years you'll, you'll spend in education. 2.5 years you'll spend grooming yourself. 2.5 years you'll spend shopping. 1.5 years you'll spend in childcare. And 1.3 years you will spend commuting. It means if you live the average age of 78, you will have nine years left over and what are you doing with it? What are you doing with it? Because here's the reality. The biggest mistake we can make in life is to think that we will always have time. 
Time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You don't keep it, but you can spend it. Once it's lost, you can never get it back. Time. And Solomon, all through the book of Ecclesiastes, is saying, hey, time is a gift. How are you stewarding it? And he's going to give us three things that he warns us against. And two are extremes. He warns us against idle laziness. But opposite of it, he warns us against manic busyness. Come on. And then he warns us against just never-ending entertainment. If you have your Bibles or your device, we're just going to look at two scriptures today. We're going to look at in Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 7, and we're going to look at Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. The importance of time. What are you doing with your dash? Read with me, starting in verse 1. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain. When the keepers of the house tremble. Solomon is going to go now into some poetry and he's going to talk. He's going to use these sayings to actually talk to us and give us the understanding because Solomon is reading at the end of his life. And he's looking back on his life and he's saying, hey, I had a life full of adventure, but not meaning. I had a, a life full of experience, but not purpose. And he's looking back on his life. He's writing at the end of his life and he's using this and he's, he, what he's doing is he is talking to us about the frailty and the finiteness of life. He says, when the keepers of the house tremble, he's talking about frailty. He's talking about the keepers of the house. When you study it in the commentary, he's talking about hands. He's talking about when your hands, when you get old and your hands shake. And the strong men stoop. He's talking about your legs. When the grinders cease because they are few. He's talking about your teeth. And those looking through the windows grow dim. He's talking about your eyes. When the doors to the street are closed. He's talking about your mouth. And the sound of grinding fades. When people rise up at the sound of birds. He's talking about insomnia and anxiety and not having any peace and rest. The sound of grind, uh, but all their songs grow faint. He's talking about the weak, feeble voice of old age. When people are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred, meaning you don't have any more, des uh, your desire is waned. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, God, before the silver cord is severed. He's talking about the nervous system. Before life ends and the golden bowl is broken, he's talking about your mind. Before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel broken at the well, he's talking about your heart. And the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the spirit returns to God who gave it. Remember your creator. 
in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come. He's saying, look, look, time. Time is valuable. It's a gift. It's not to be misused. It's not to be squandered. It's, it's to be stewarded well. Let me say this to you. We relate to time well when we understand it's a precious gift to be stewarded, not a valueless possession to be squandered and abused. He's talking about time. He says this, that there's three things that we have to watch. The first is this, is called idle laziness. It's where, I think it's uh, epidemic in our culture today. Can't tell you how many times the temptation has hit me where, you know, it's like, oh man, life is tough. I just, I just kind of want to sit here and veg. Now listen, the Bible talks a lot about also like Sabbath and getting proper rest and making sure, right? That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about like, look, I'm just going to be honest with you, okay? Like, if I can sit there and watch six hours of Maury Povich, <laughs> come on. If I can sit there and watch 16 episodes in a row of This Is Us to get caught up, come on. Is that really where I want to be spending my time? Knowing that it's limited. Or am I going to invest it into things that are really worthwhile? He says, man, don't waste your time. Steve Jobs said this, your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. But then, so he warns us against idle laziness, but then he warns us against endless entertainment. Endless entertainment. Come on, we live in the first world, right? where we, we literally have literally access to, to entertainment and all the, just all the time. Pastor years ago out at Mosaic Church in California, he did a teaching and he said, I really believe that this generation, uh, uh, we live our lives his name was Erwin McManus. He said, we live our lives through watching other people live theirs. We, we, he goes, we have gotten so trained in this country that we actually think that we're living it when we're actually just watching other people live it. We're living vicariously through them. Come on, I... I like, I get it, right? Like, I get it. Like, I, 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 you know, last Thursday, we were there at 3 o'clock for a 6 o'clock showing of, you know, Endgame. Bob Bullock, right? We've seen, like, but, but what Solomon's warning us about here is kind of this, this thing where it's just endless entertainment. What can I do next? What can I do next? What can, this and this and this. I'm going to do. 
and we don't ever invest in the things that are really important. Let me say this. Look, just look at your life. Evaluate your life. And, and, th and look and say, like, okay, I have to do it all the time. And say, okay, like, I've spent this month 50 hours watching Marvel movies. And I've spent one hour on the kingdom of God. <laughs> He's saying, look, it's out of balance. He's like, hey, invest into the things that are, are most important. Use your time wisely. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 5 through 17, and Paul says it this way. Paul says, Starting in verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. He uses this term, redeem the time. It's kind of an odd way to say it. So what, is, what does it mean? What does it See that you walk circumspectly, wisely, cautiously, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because you only have so much. Come on. I mean, what would Nipsey Hussle say? Right? Come on, I was talking to my son literally yesterday, my 23-year-old son, and I said, I said, Elijah, listen, two years ago, I'm driving over to meet a guy for dinner to go to a Rouse High School football game. We're going to meet and have dinner and go to the game. And he never shows up. I'm texting him, texting him, texting him, texting him. Never shows up. I'm thinking, man, okay, like, dude, he's like blowing me off. I literally get home. I open my computer. I go to Facebook just to check my Facebook. And literally it says, rest in peace. Literally, a guy that I was texting with at 2.45 in the afternoon, planning on going to eat at Chili's, died at 2.55. And I did his funeral two miles from here at Beck Funeral Home. What Solomon's saying is like, guys, we all think we always are going to have more time. And, and we don't. So he says, listen, redeem the time. And what that word redeem means, it means to buy back or to buy up. To buy back or to buy up your time. What he's saying is, listen, Time is limited. It's a gift. Steward it well. Redeem the time. Buy it back from everything else that's trying to, to grab it from you. So he tells us, don't go idle laziness. Come on. Come on. We just we read seven verses 
at the end of Ecclesiastes where he's saying, like, I'm just being honest with you guys. I'm on the phone the other day. I'm driving to go pick up my daughter, Mia. I call my dad, who's going to be 75 this summer. I call him every single day I drive over. It's a 10-minute drive. I call my dad. I'm talking to him the other day. He says, he says I feel like I'm 40. I can't believe I have a son who's going to be 52. I can't believe I'm... Like, Dave... It went by like that. Because seriously, like, I was 40, then I was 70. <laughs> what happened? Solomon's saying, man, don't waste your time. Don't throw it into endless entertainment. And yet at the same time, don't go the way of what this culture is pushing you to. Manic busyness. Come on. Come on, we live in America. It's churning. Keep up, keep up, keep up, keep up. Come on, every commercial you see, every Facebook post you see, every Instagram post you see, it's this, and I'm here, and I'm going here, and look what I got, and ba da 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 right? And, and, and not only do we live in America that this is the prevailing culture, but we live in Texas, <laughs> where everything is bigger and faster and better. Not only do we live in Texas, we live in Austin, Texas, which is, as I just saw, for the eighth straight year, the fastest growing city in America. And the culture will try to push us to keep up, keep up, keep up, keep up. Come on. When we moved here from Indianapolis, Indianapolis is a great city. Austin's the 10th largest city. Indianapolis is the 11th. I felt like I was in a time warp. I'm like, dude, it's so much faster here in Austin. Businesses and happening and this and that and keep up. Bah. And the culture is just always going to push you to manic Busyness. And Solomon is saying, it's a hamster wheel. Because you never arrive. Because when you get, it's what we talked about last week, it's the fallacy of change and the fallacy of more. Because as soon as you get there, Everything changes. You get there, you get the house. Now you need all the new furniture. Now you need the pool. Now you got to have more insurance. Now you got to do this. Now you got to have more people. And then you get there and it changes again. And Solomon is just, he's saying, it never, it never ends. It never ends. So he says, you have to intentionally, intentionally buy back the time. You buy it back. What are you going to invest into? Come on. We talked about this last week. There's only like four things that trans, that the great equalizer is death. There's only four things that transition over. Your relationship with God, the people that you've ministered to that are coming with you, the things that you did for God, and the things that you invested into of the kingdom of God that transcends you. 
Your house doesn't go with you. Your boat doesn't go with you. Your medals don't go with you. Your degrees don't go with you. Your Gucci doesn't go with you. It doesn't. And Solomon's saying, man, it's where we started. It's this. It's not that earthly joys are worthless. They're not ultimate. Ultimate meaning and fulfillment comes from knowing, connecting with, and enjoying God in everything he's given us. Come on. He's speaking to us. He's speaking to us. Right now. It's like, what? Redeem the time. What are you going to invest into? It's going to go like this. Man, don't let the culture sap you. Don't, don't, don't let it drive you. You be the pilot. You say, hey, no, this is, I'm, for me, just being honest. I'll close with this. I got done playing basketball. I had all these opportunities. Go here, do this, blah, 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 blah. Part of my ego was driving me. Dave, you got to go do something better than being in the NBA. So when people come up to you and they say, hey, what are you doing now? I can be like, yeah, man, like I own a company. Yeah, man, like I'm in law school. Yeah, man. Duh. It was all ego. And I'm not saying that stuff's bad. But I remember sitting there thinking, at what cost? At what cost? Cost of my marriage? Not willing to pay it. Cost of my kids? Not willing to pay it. Cost of my relationship with God? Not willing to pay it. Come on. My second NBA team. I'm sitting in the hotel meeting room. Coach stands up. He says, hey, what happens here? Doesn't go out to anybody. Close all the doors. Five strippers come in. I got up, walked out. A week later, he calls me into his office and he says, you're not a fit here. We're going to cut you. Somebody asked me two weeks ago, would, would you still do it? Like you, you, you lost an NBA job. I said, in a heartbeat. Not, not willing to pay that cost. This is what Solomon's saying. Speaking wisdom to us. Don't let it drive you. Don't chase it. Start with God. Enjoy God. Enjoy when you enjoy Him, then you can enjoy what He's given you. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for <laughs> who you are. God, you are so amazing. You're so beautiful. You're so, God, Lord, we find our, our joy and our satisfaction in knowing you and serving you and walking with you and enjoying the things that you've given us. Father, I just pray that this message, God, would just speak to, they wouldn't chase all the things that the world tells us to chase. And they wouldn't be driven by all the things that the world tells us to be driven by. God, let us have balance. Let us redeem the time. Let us invest into the things that really matter. 
because everything else around us is fighting that. We thank you for it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.